Thank you, everyone, for uh, for taking some time out of your busy schedules to join us for this month's security webinar. Uh, really excited about the topic that we're going to be covering today. And if you were joining us last month, we introduced our 2021 cybersecurity guide. And this is really the culmination of all of coalition's sort of best cybersecurity recommendations for small and mid-sized businesses. And in this we month's webinar, we're going to talk about one of the items in particular data encryption and why it's so critical for organizations to implement good controls around their data in order to protect not only their own data hygiene, but also their customers, their vendors, their partners. I'm really excited to be joined by two of my colleagues this morning. Uh, first, Jeremy Turner. He's the head of Threat Intel at Coalition and his team is the one that's looking for threats and vulnerabilities that target our policyholders and determining how we can best protect and prevent claims from happening. I'm also joined by Dale Schulenberg, who's on Coalition's claims team. Now, this is the team that responds in the unfortunate event that an organization does have an incident, uh, and they are helping our policyholders and our broker partners sort of follow through with all of the response that happens after an event. So coordinating with claims, uh, with legal counsel, with vendors and forensics and all of the various pieces that need to happen to help organizations recover. And my name is Jen and I'll be moderating the conversation this morning. First, just a quick note on Zoom before we really dive in. You should see at the bottom of your screen, two different icons, first a chat icon and a Q and A. And you can submit questions through either one of these and I'll be moderating throughout the conversation. So feel free to submit questions at any point in time. And we'll also have some time at the end for some dedicated Q&A. We're excited to be joined by a group of brokers and policyholders. So thank you everyone again for making time to, to join us and learn more about this topic. Coalition is the fastest growing provider of cyber insurance and security solutions in the US and Canada. Uh, and you're all here because we either are your insurance provider or we partner with you to offer insurance to clients. So thank you again for placing your trust in us and for your partnership. One of the things that's you know, unique about us relative to others in the marketplace is the fact that we do have such deep in-house security claims and incident response expertise. And that's why we're excited to share some of these recommendations and, and some of the specific learnings that we've had about how organizations can best protect themselves from experiencing a cyber event in the first place. I'm gonna talk about a few different topics in today's discussion. First, Jeremy is gonna give a recap about the cybersecurity guide and the recommendations that are included within that guide. Then we'll talk specifically about data encryption what it is, why it's important, and what are some of our, our recommendations and best practices for how to ensure you have proper data encryption in place. Next, we're gonna talk about a couple of case studies. Uh, first, some learnings from the capital breach that happened a few weeks ago, as well as uh, just examples of how claims can play out when data is encrypted versus not. And finally, at the end, we will have some time reserved for Q&A. So thank you, and with that, I'm happy to turn it over to my colleague, Jeremy. Hey, thanks, Jen. Yeah, glad to have you all here and glad to review some of the, um, you know, the items that we have on you know, today's topics. I have um, you know, come to Coalition um, you know, having a background in the defense and intelligence uh, space uh, and also in um, kind of management consulting for different commercial entities. And um, you know, I found that uh, you know, for for cybersecurity products, there's really nothing that beats uh, having an insurance product because you know, a firewall or antivirus that you can buy isn't going to help you recover <laughs> necessarily, but insurance is is going to uh, you know help you recover. Um, so some of the things that we um, have noticed that can help us really um, you know recover faster or you know expedite the recovery process for organizations when they do experience a cyber incident are in Coalition Cybersecurity Guide. And one of the ones that we want to talk about specifically today um, is data encryption um, and kind of how that fits into this, this overall picture of um, helping increase and boost your security posture, uh, lowering the, the time to recovery, and just providing a lot of benefits that may not, might not be completely obvious um, unless you've actually experienced um, you know, one of these events. Um, but well, before we dive into you know, the, the encryption specifically, you know, let's just kind of cover like a general overview of some of the recommendations that we make broadly. Um, 
you know, for, for increasing email security, um, this is part of our cybersecurity uh, assessment. We often look at things like sender policy framework and DMARC that help other companies understand when they're getting mail from you, it actually came from your organization. Um, there's also some, some great benefits to implementing multi-factor authentication. Um, you know, famously, a lot of the, um, you know, the, the political organizations that run campaigns um, you know, we didn't didn't see um, the kind of stuff that we saw in previous years, and that was in large part because these, um, you know, the political organizations have been doing a really good job of implementing multi-factor authentication, which really posed a uh, significant barrier to entry for different groups uh, trying to steal emails. Um, and one of the other things that we always, you know, kind of recommend is, um, you know, backing up your data. So anytime you have like a ransomware event, um, you know, the first thing that adversaries are going to go looking for are your data backups. Um, they wanna encrypt those too. So implementing backups and then kind of storing them in a safe place um, so that they can't be accessed by those adversaries if they were, were, ever, were ever to get inside the network, um, also a very key consideration. Um, you know, as we're all kind of working in a different situation now with COVID, obviously enabling secure remote access um, is also a very important consideration. Um, there's ways to do that. Um, and then there's there's ways that actually can kind of create additional exposures. Um, you know, one of the things that we kind of always, um, you know, like to mention specifically is RDP. You know, if you were to put RDP or remote desktop sharing, like the Windows desktop sharing up on the internet, your organization's significantly more likely to have um, a cyber event, you know, even if it's fully secured and everything else, just the mere exposure of those uh, remote access softwares and remote access platforms signal to attackers that, hey, there's a juicy target in here. There's some network infrastructure or something that you can go after. You know, it's kind of the equivalent of, um, you know, wearing a big like diamond uh, necklace or something like that, saying that, look, there's there's something here that's of value. Um, and then that's where the adversaries kind of start their planning operations on how they can actually target those 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 things that they want to get. Um, so exposing that remote access software is a, is a, is a big concern. Um, you know, updating software. Also very important, um, you know, one of the things that led to remote a remote desktop being targeted so specifically was this vulnerability called Bluekeep. Um, it basically just let attackers kind of just bypass that login screen and password altogether and just get access directly to the system and start deploying ransomware. And they totally did. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, when, when we are looking at logging into all these different websites and services uh, that we use as part of our daily tasks, especially now that we're all remote, um, you know, is to use a password manager. So we all have different sites that we're using, um, you know, to log into email, to log into our uh, customer relationship management platforms, to log into accounting softwares. Um, you know, using a password manager is a great way that you don't have to worry about remembering these huge, long, complex passwords. You can just remember one huge, long, complex password that can help you get access to the rest of, uh, you know, randomly generated passwords um, that'll be more secure than ones that we would choose normally as humans. Um, and then uh, also like antivirus. Uh, so, you know, just good old antivirus, uh, scanning for malicious software that we know about and uh, potentially unwanted programs uh, that can create some additional exposure. Um, you know, those are great basic controls. Um, I'll skip encryption since we're gonna go into that um, uh, specifically here. But uh, also other, some other great controls are implementing a, a security awareness training program. Uh, probably one of the most cost-effective cybersecurity controls any company of any size can implement is to engage in phishing training. Um, you know, there's, you know, dollar for dollar, um, it's the, 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 the greatest impact maybe next to like implementing multi-factor authentication. Um, but employee security awareness is something that is, has a lasting impact in organizations. And um, phishing emails of all types are the most common vector, whether that's a fraudulent funds transfer email, whether that's trying to get somebody to install a malicious application. Um, you know, these phishing emails are the number one way that uh, attackers are trying to get inside organizations. So if you're doing everything else right, you know, they're still gonna try to send some emails and get people to click on some stuff. Um, so it's important to have that training. Um, and then finally, you know, the reason we're all here, purchase cyber insurance. Um, you know, I've, I've worked at developing other commercial uh, cybersecurity products. And I can tell you that none of them were as effective as insurance because uh, it doesn't matter you know, how expensive the firewall is or how, how robust the antivirus is. Uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the cyber risks are in the, the threat actors are still gonna find ways around those controls. So it's important to have insurance in place uh, that'll help you actually recover uh, from those those cyber events and kind of make the business whole again. Jeremy, so, before we move on from that, I've actually gotten a couple questions specifically on this uh, these topics. 
And one comment I just want to make, you know, Jeremy made the point that phishing emails are by far the most common entry point. Just to put a number behind that, in our 2020 claims report that we released last year, we noted that 54% of claims resulted from, uh, from phishing emails. And then other 6% were from other social engineering tactics. So just put that in perspective, 60% of every claim reported to us was the result of some sort of phishing activity. So it is extremely significant, as he mentioned. Um, I'm just going to a couple of the questions. Yeah. We had a question about RDP and whether we would whether we would say that that's secure if insureds are using a VPN to protect RDP. Yeah, if the um, if the VPN if the RDP is behind a VPN, meaning you have to log into the VPN first before you can even like see or kind of access that first login screen for RDP. Um, that is actually a great control um, because the, the thing is that like the attackers are looking for that signal, you know, so in this in the kind of the earlier example about the, the kind of the big diamond necklace that kind of signals to attackers that there's something of value to kind of take there. You know, that'd be the, the equivalent of, you know, you put a scarf on, nobody can tell that you have a big diamond necklace. Um, and, you know, so that's kind of effectively the same kind of control that, um, that you, using a VPN provides is they just can't see that there's something of value to, uh, to target there. And it makes a big difference because you know, even if they aren't able to log in directly to that remote desktop platform, uh, if they have to like guess passwords or something like that, um, we notice that a lot of times adversaries don't even bother trying that first. The first, the, the very next thing they'll do is start sending phishing emails to try to get people's usernames and passwords that they can then try to log into the RDP. And by that time, they've already started doing the phishing attacks. Um, so they already have some information. Um, so that's kind of like that, that signal where you know, not, not every time are the attackers going to go straight in into the front door or kind of just walk up and try to grab that necklace. Sometimes they might just sit there and kind of case the joint a little bit and figure out, is there a better way that they can attack the situation to be undetected or to get what they're after? Um, and using a VPN just kind of eliminates that whole kind of targeting process from even starting, um, which is the best scenario. So eliminating RDP as a signal um, is, is the objective that we usually recommend for all our insureds. Um, because we know that like just because the RDP exists, there's going to be some targeting. And it's it's that targeting process that kind of leads to a more ambiguous, you know, question mark of is something bad going to happen? Whereas we know that for sure, if they don't have RDP exposed, they won't be targeted, you know, in general. Great, thank you. Um, Another question came in about password managers and if we have any specific password managers that we recommend that people use for personal or for work use. Uh, yeah, so I guess um, at Coalition, we're using 1Password. Um, and um, I've got to say that, you know, as far as ease of use, um, I really enjoy using it, um, you know, especially if you have a Mac or any other device that has a fingerprint reader. Um, being able to unlock the password manager with your fingerprint without even having to type a password is actually just kind of improves the whole experience in general. Um, so saving you know us from typing all these long complex passwords over and over, or even having to remember them, you know usually you just have to type it in once when you first start your computer up, and then you can use your fingerprint or another biometrics to kind of unlock those passwords. Um, and you know I've got to say that you know it's it's better than you know it's more efficient to use the password manager and more secure. Um, than just kind of uh, relying on trying to remember passwords or even type them in. Thank you. And we, there are a couple other specific questions coming in on this topic, but one thing I want to note is that we're going to send out the cybersecurity guide and we'll also mention at the end of the presentation how you can get access to it. And the guide itself has a lot of specific recommendations and vendor recommendations as well that you can reference and share with your employees, your, your team, your, your clients, et cetera. Great. So then uh, the one that we skipped over in that list, encryption. So, um, you know, this is kind of a, you know, it can be kind of nebulous and kind of hard to understand. Uh, there's a lot of different ways encryption can be used. Um, really what we're kind of talking about uh, when we say using encryption is we're, we're talking about encrypting the uh, actual devices that we cart around. So like encrypting laptops, even actually encrypting desk desktops and servers, because, you know, those can be stolen, misplaced, replaced, recycled. Um, you know, so making sure that data is encrypted while it's at rest um, is a very, very important security control. And there's been some recent um, kind of events that kind of actually highlight some of the, uh, the reasons why that's such an important control. Um, but, you know, in general, 
encryption is you know how we are able to take data and place it onto devices and then have confidence that if if we lose the device or we no longer have access to it somebody else can't pick it up and start looking through it and access our data um you know if we you know if you have like a an iphone or um you know an android device you know odds are that that device actually encrypts the data um you know and you know so every time you turn it on you have to enter the passcode that's what actually unlocks it um, and decrypts the data so until you enter that first passcode that first time none of the data on that device is actually readable uh, even if you're able to plug it into another device or something like that um, you know that's why even uh, law enforcement organizations have had a hard time accessing uh, data on those devices is, is because it's well protected um, you know that's the kind of thing that we're looking to say you know, it's uh, it's almost infinitely cheaper to replace the device than it is to replace the data that's on it, or to to risk the exposure of uh, some certain types of data. Um, and you know, when we when we talk about you know even you know work computers or personal devices, um, you know even work devices have a lot of very specific behaviors, or maybe even some things that we don't even understand are actually being collected and stored on those devices. Um, you know, for example, all the wireless networks that you've ever connected to, whether that's your home. You know, an office, a hotel. You know, all that data is generally stored on your device, um, and that could actually be pretty sensitive, um, depending on you know what your your home network password or you know work network password. Um, it's not just the data um, that's on these devices that we need to encrypt. It's also all the different ways we access different resources that might actually have even more data um, that are also important to protect. Um, but in general, you know, the, the phys physical loss of losing a device is far cheaper than actually the, the data exposure um, that, that might be kind of otherwise a big question mark if, the, if a device is ever lost. Um, and then there's also the, um, the, uh, re the regulatory concerns, you know, for PCI and PII and, and HIPAA, and there's all these different regulations that require this. So, you know, even, even if you're a business, there's a question mark of whether or not those things actually apply to you. There's a lot of benefits to just do it anyway, <laughs> and uh, hopefully that some of the scenarios that we can kind of you know uh, bring to light from some recent events will help kind of underscore that. Um, it, you know, and, and just in general, when we do kind of think about how how to implement encryption, there's some some good things to consider. Um, you know, there's uh, there's kind of different levels or different ways that you can implement it, um, and it's also important to consider that um, you know when you do encrypt your phone or your laptop, uh, it's, it's important to consider um, how you might want to recover that data um, should you not be able to you know, type that password or how to store backup features as well. And we can kind of discuss some of those uh, in the next slide. Um, so you know, why does encryption matter? You know, we, we talked about the, um, the kind of regulatory exposures and some of the kind of the, the you know, tangentially some of the things about like data theft or whatnot. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the complexity of incidents when there's data exposed, when you're using encryption versus not using encryption um, is, is pretty significant. So when it say, for example, you have um, a hospital and a laptop is, is lost and that laptop is encrypted, you might be out maybe $3,000, right? So for the laptop or whatever. Now, if there's a question mark. Maybe, maybe it's maybe the device could have been encrypted, but we just don't know for sure. Um, then you know, organizations kind of have to err on the side of caution, or you have to spend additional money doing forensics to look at all the different systems that system accessed, or you know, maybe some other ways you can tell if that device is encrypted or not. Um, and that can start to get expensive. All those things start to incur cost. Um, whereas having a very rigid uh, process and program to take accountability of um, the devices that are encrypted and what data they have um, helps really understand exposure and then you know what 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 is the response process that's required if that data or device is ever exposed so you know when we look at like a, a, that device that's lost you know a simple three thousand dollar device is pretty simple to replace if it has a database of all the patients on it totally different scenario um, so you know encryption in general um, in most cases is, is a um, a very low cost, uh, you know, feature to implement, you know, nowadays in, in most operating systems in Windows, we have BitLocker, um, on Macs, you have uh, File Vault, um, you know, just enabling that and, and making sure that you can actually audit um, that that has actually been enabled um, is a very important case. And it has such a huge impact um, when there's potential data exposure 
um, you know, it has a huge impact on a potential incident or a potential loss to an organization. Um, and sometimes, you know, you might not even need to file a claim if it's just a simple device that's like lost. You can just replace the device um, and and move on. Um, you know, if a device is lost and it's not encrypted, um, then there kind of needs to be the the exercise of maybe understanding, you know, what data was there or what kind of was the potential exposure, um, and that's where costs kind of already start getting incurred. Jeremy, can you talk about some of the differences with data encryption on physical devices like laptops and mobile devices versus data that's stored in the cloud or in, or in a server? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so th with, with things like phones and, and laptops, um, you know, modern devices, there's actually like a chip that um, kind of provides like that level of encryption or maybe even some software that provides, um, you know, the encryption uh, for the device. Um, and this kind of differs between cloud solutions uh, a little bit, um, but in, in general, um, the idea is that uh, encryption requires the user to enter a password to be able to decrypt the data, just like we do when we you know, reboot our iPhones. Um, the same is true for cloud. So those cloud systems um, are also encrypting data and require you know, the user to log in or otherwise authenticate before that data can be decrypted. Um, and you know, the, the same kind of um, you know, analog is true of if we think of those encrypted secure containers that we use on different cloud services like Box and other ones that are even like HIPAA approved. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of using the same approach where once you enter that password, then your data is encrypted. But even those um, data providers in the cloud, a lot of them are not even able to recover your data um, if you forget your password. <laughs> so it's important to consider uh, when you implement encryption that this is a, um, a very powerful uh, data control. Um, at the same time, you don't want to lose your data. So it's good to understand um, and you know ask those questions like you know we're just asked, you know like you know what are the, what is the difference between you know the cloud encrypting and you know different things that we have on our devices. Um, and it's good to understand exactly, you know, when you're going into evaluating providers or cloud data providers, you know, what is the, the password recovery process? And if I forget my uh, encryption keys, like how do I get them back? Or what's the, what's the way to store those or escrow those somewhere uh, where we can, in a disaster, we can recover those things. Um, those are all very important considerations as well. So um, a recent event, um, and also kind of a really good case study in uh, you know, when encryption is, is very important, um, or when there is um, you know, any kind of physical uh, access or physical breach of an environment that we consider secure or controlled, you know, whether that's an office um, where somebody you know, smashes a window and enters the office, um, you know, now everything is really kind of just a question mark, you know, what was accessed? Maybe we know, maybe we don't. Um, you kind of have to assume that everything was really. Um, so, you know, if we look at the the recent event in the in the Capitol breach, you know, there was a, a group that gained illegal access to otherwise secured environments that have uh, pretty controlled access requirements. Um, and on top of that, numerous devices were reported to be lost, stolen, or damaged. And then certainly because um, you know the the general security and operational security level of this environment changed uh, very significantly. Um, pretty much every device that's in there, whether it's a phone, whether it's a uh, smart TV, whether it's a laptop, um, all these kind of devices need to be kind of accounted for. And then you kind of have to think specifically like what kind of information could be exposed uh, from all of these devices. Um, and you know, in the in the age of smart devices and like all the you know the different like cell phones and uh, internet enabled devices that we have, whether that's a thermostat, a a water cooler, you know, each one of those things has sensitive data. You know, like say somebody's you know stole a coffee pot that was Wi-Fi enabled, well that has the Wi-Fi password on it. <laughs> you know, so it's you have to kind of consider the um, the order of effect of all these different devices and how those devices are secured and whether they're encrypted or not. Um, and in the cases of you know those Wi-Fi connected coffee pots, they are generally not encrypted, unfortunately. Um, so that you know, if, if somebody steals those, they would actually be able to recover the Wi-Fi password for whatever network that was connected to, uh, whether that's like you know Intel's uh, you know corporate network or that's a, a political office within the Capitol building. Um, you know, those networks can now be exposed uh, because those devices that actually had uh, the access keys may not have been encrypted. 
Um, and so like, that's, you know, kind of what happened, you know, so as we kind of look at the, the greater impact of that, you know, what, so, so now what happens? Um, well, first they have to kind of inventory every single device that was in the building um, and try to understand uh, what was there, what was exposed, uh, was the device encrypted, what data would it have had on it? And the kind of this, this painstaking reconstruction of um, all these different um, potential exposures and not only that, but then for each device that's stolen, um, you know, they kind of have to go back through an audit. We'll be like, okay, did we ever check to make sure that that device was encrypted? Um, if it was, you know, was it a, a strong password? Like, do we enforce a password policy so somebody couldn't just use, you know, Snoopy one two three or you know some easy easy to guess password on this and you know encrypted device that has all the sensitive data? Because um, humans are humans, and you know we don't like complex passwords. So the odds are it's probably not very complex unless there's a policy to enforce it. Um, and so there's a lot of questions um, and different audit processes that, that need to be initiated to kind of understand what the potential exposure really is. Um, and then for, for every device, you know, even if it's just a quote unquote work laptop or a work phone, um, like we were talking about earlier, you know, the, um, the, the level of data about our, our pattern of life and where we go, where we travel, our home networks that we connect to when we're working from home, you know, all those things can actually create not just breaches for um, you know, a political office or a, a, a corporation, but you know, especially in this scenario, that could lead to a lot of um, larger order personal effects or people being targeted specifically, or their their home networks being attacked. Um, if there's kind of information that would kind of reveal uh, that exposure, and so it's it's important to kind of really take like a really good what we call like a red team approach or like the adversaries approach. Like what what's the worst that could possibly happen if somebody with ill intent was to be able to get a hold of these devices, and um, they kind of need to do that for every single device that's been reported missing in that environment. Um, and aside from that, you know, uh, there's also the you know finding new devices that showed up part of the equation, but that's an entire, entirely separate story. <laughs> Jeremy, what's the learning that companies should take from this in terms of how they should best be prepared? Hopefully this never happens to anyone on this call, but what's the learning that people can take away about how they can be prepared should something like this ever happen to their organization? Absolutely. So, I mean, I think that, you know, everybody had thought that this was pretty unimaginable um, that this situation would happen. Uh, I certainly did not anticipate this. Um, so I think it's important to consider that, you know, the, the reason we all buy insurance is because there's an infinite number of things that we don't know can happen that are going to happen. Um, and so I guess using this kind of example as a case study, you know, take a, take a, you know, uh, a kind of approach as an adversary and start to think like a, like a hacker or like an adversary and think about, you know, if, if you were to gain entry to your office, like what devices, you know, could you take? that would cause irreparable harm uh, to your business. And then just think about, you know, you know, if that device was stolen, would I be out the cost of the device? Would I be missing like data that's not backed up? Would there be data on there that's not encrypted that would then be exposed that an attacker could get access to? Um, so the more that we're able to think like an attacker, um, the more that we're able to kind of plan in advance of, you know, those things that could happen. And then just kind of make uh, informed and strategic decisions, um, you know, and cost-effective decisions to kind of uh, prevent as many of those as we possibly can, while not, you know, overly uh, encumbering business processes. So keeping things fluid and open as much as possible, but implementing uh, these controls uh, where it makes sense. Thank you. Uh, I think with that, we're going to hand over to Dale, who's going to talk about some more specifics on the insurance angle and how insurance uh, can kick in in terms of supporting companies in the event that this happens to them. Thanks, Jen. And uh, this kind of piggybacks on Jeremy's last example, uh, dealing with laptops being stolen, uh, encrypted or unencrypted. So, you know, in, in scenario one, if you have a laptop that's encrypted and, you know, uh, someone from the company has taken their laptop on a business trip and it ends up being stolen. Uh, if the device is encrypted, then you will likely not have as much cost, at least on the claim side, dealing with your, your insurance policy. Um, and where that really comes into play for our policy is breach response cost and, and expenses. And, and really, if the laptop's encrypted, most of the vendors on our panel that do the breach response work um, have a two free hour consultation. And they can talk to you about 
what type of data might have been on the uh, the laptop. Um, you know, again, kind of going back to Jeremy's about how strong that password was, uh, and, and just kind of go through what your notification obligations might be. Again, this will probably result in either no cost or minimal cost because you know you you've encrypted your data and and likely you're not going to have any type of notification obligations there. Um, scenario number two is if the laptop's unencrypted again same individual takes their laptop it gets stolen on a business trip this time it's unencrypted and you do know that they carry PII records um, on their laptop to the extent that you're able to go back and, and take a look at what type of records they actually had on there and, and the information involved and and actually be able to uh, you know audit that uh, from the company and uh, you know we'll again we'll we'll Put you in touch with breach council you'll still have the two free hours but you're definitely probably going to go over the two free hour mark there um you're going to have to look at um what your notification obligations are if it's pii you're likely going to have to notify people um that's going to lead to you know your legal fees notification cost dealing with credit monitoring um data mining will come into play and that kind of goes into your notification cost but but these costs can start to add up pretty quickly, depending on how many records have been um, impacted. And uh, you know, you're looking at anywhere from uh, you know six. You easily could hit sixty thousand. It could be more. It really depends on uh, the the data set that we're looking at and um, how many people need to be notified. That's yeah, it for just, those two, Jen. <laughs> yeah, just to underscore that one more time, I know that both Dale and, and Jeremy addressed this, but the difference between encrypting your data means on the left-hand side, only needing to you know, engage with our free breach council and pay for the replacement of your laptop, which might be you know, a couple thousand bucks versus the right-hand side, you're talking about a full-blown data breach with claims council, other legal counsel, uh, you might have media and PR to help sort of protect the the notification about the event. Uh, you might have to do notification to customers and vendors and ongoing credit monitoring. And so the difference between these two scenarios is so significant, not only in terms of the cost and the headache that would be resulting for the company, but also just what the recovery process looks like. So it just really underscores how, how critical it is to have your data encrypted and how much of a headache that can help prevent. Absolutely right, Jen. And I, we dive a little bit more into the, the different um, stuff that uh, our insurance would, would cover on this next slide. <laughs> so, uh, you know, forensic expenses, this covers your forensic investigation, um, you know, to the extent that they're able to go into uh, Again, the actual records that were kept on that that laptop. Uh, hopefully, the the company does know what was on uh, the individual laptops that are taken out. Uh, but but that forensic investigation, uh, depending on the the depth needed, um, can run anywhere from you know five to twenty thousand uh, dollars. Also, depending on the vendor, your attorney and your public relation fees. These are you know this is covered by our policy as well. Attorney's fees, uh, if, if we're getting into notification obligations uh, and, and they're needing to help you put together, you know, notification letters and, um, you know, a memo on exactly what you need to, to notify, their fees can start to, to creep up there as well. And, and I, we're looking at anywhere from about 10 to 20,000 for our average um, event where we need to notify. Uh, public relation fees, uh, as Jen mentioned, sometimes you're going to need to, to uh, have a public relations vendor come in and either help you put out uh, notifications or to help you manage this event um, if it's been publicly uh, disclosed, uh, has some type of media coverage or anything of that nature, um, just so they can help you be prepared to, to deal with any type of client or customer um, questions that come your way. Um, and going into notification fees, uh, we do cover voluntary, but we also recover uh, the required uh, notifications that are, you know, deemed by regulatory and state laws. Um, you 
we will really come in as we are able to decide what the actual uh, set of data that was impacted. Um, data mining, as I said, will come into play uh, if we're able to take a look at that information and they can help uh, determine and narrow down what the size may be, but it's not really a, a cheap process. Um, I've seen anywhere from 10,000 to, uh, I think one of my more recent ones was closer to uh, $150,000 for just data mining fees alone. So it really, uh, really behooves everyone to, to encrypt your data uh, and, and make sure that you're not having to incur these, these fees. Dale, beyond the fees, what do you typically see in terms of the recovery timeline from first detecting or identifying an event through sort of everything is closed, notification window is done. Like what kind of what kind of time window do you typically see for these types of claims? Well, something for like the, the scenario used for stolen laptop uh, would probably be done within a, a few months. Uh, you know, when it comes to the credit monitoring piece, uh, there's usually a deadline and that can be set out a, a few, few months after the uh, credit monitoring has been offered. So that can kind of push it out uh, a little bit further, but it, as far as the, the main part of the incident response, it, a few months is, is typical, um, but it could stretch out just a little bit if you're, you have a credit monitoring deadline that, that goes beyond that. Uh, so four months, maybe uh, max. It, it, it really depends on how in depth the data is that we're looking at and, and how, how much uh, you know, data mining and whatnot we may need, but I would say the average is probably two to four months. Thank you. Uh, we're getting a ton of questions in on various topics. So I'm gonna turn to some of those questions and, and keep submitting them either through the Q&A box or the chat. Um, I've had a couple specific questions about how specifically to encrypt your data. And wanna just note that in the security guide itself, we do provide sort of step-by-step -step instructions on how to encrypt your data on different types of devices for both personal computers uh, or sorry, computers and mobile devices as well. So I think we won't dive into that in too much detail here, just because you can reference the guide and get some more specific step-by-step um, -step instructions. So we'll follow up with that. A um, couple of other questions though that I, that I think would be helpful to go into, back to some of the specific recommendations in the guide. And Jeremy, I'd love for you to address this first one about password managers. So beyond the password managers that we recommend it, and we talk about a couple of them, like 1Password and LastPass, are Apple and Google's built-in password managers or the Chrome extension password manager, are those ones that we would recommend people use for either personal or work use? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. And I'm really grateful that that got asked. Um, yeah, so uh, an important consideration is that um, not all password managers are created equal. Um, and uh, in particular, the Chrome extension and actually also Firefox, Internet Explorer, Safari, all, the, all these internet browsers that use um, these kind of pre-filled passwords. Um, once you log into your computer and you open that browser, uh, technically speaking, all those passwords are decrypted. Um, and malware authors are keenly aware of this. Um, and they actually, there's actually almost always in different banking Trojans, uh, there's a module that actually harvests browser passwords and also, you know, browsers like saved browser forms, which include things like address, credit card numbers, passwords, like all those different things. Um, so not all password managers are created equal, and it's important to pick a password manager that it's that's actually a, um, you know, one of those specific password managers that requires you to kind of re-enter your password or use a biometric each time you access it. Um, because once you once you enter that information, once you enter that password or that fingerprint, um, those passwords are decrypted uh, and available. That's how you're able to get them out. But um, those applications are designed specifically so that other applications can't scrape them uh, or get all those passwords. Um, whereas different browsers um, and, and other applications that might, might ask you to save your password to them are, are not necessarily uh, the same. Um, so yeah, there's a, a key exposure there with that, um, the, you know, the Chrome uh, extension with Firefox, with Internet Explorer, with all the browsers that I know of, um, where that's actually not a good thing um, to use those built-in kind of save your password features. Um, 
it's much better to use, uh, you know, one pass, last pass, key pass, uh, one of those other password managers that kind of create a, a like, little, literally like a, a little encrypted vault, um, where even when you log in, into your computer, those things aren't automatically decrypted or accessible by everything else in the operating system, the way that the browser passwords are. Um, so very good distinction to make. Thank you. Great, thanks for addressing that. And I know it's it's important because I think so many of us are so used to the pop-up coming up on your phone or in Chrome, and it seems like a far easier solution than using a password manager, but a really good reminder that it's it's not the most secure solution. So thanks for addressing that. A um, couple questions have come in about the SolarWinds attack and how that might be impacting the security industry as a whole, as well as coalition and sort of how we think about risk scanning for policyholders. And Jeremy, I'd be really curious to get your take on that since I know we did a blog on this a couple weeks back and the situation has evolved significantly since then, but would love to hear your thoughts on that question. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, having spent some time in the defense space um, and in a lot of the organizations that were impacted by this uh, solar winds breach, I think it's important to consider that when we see these headlines, um, you know, uh, different activities that kind of fall into the category of espionage, uh, which the solar winds breach definitely did, um, more often than not, don't lead to claims. They don't lead to the same kind of commercial exposures that are typically found with things like ransomware and, um, and banking Trojans. These more like the things that fall into like the espionage category uh, typically are run by foreign intelligence organizations that don't necessarily have direct financial motives. And then there's, there's a lot like a lot of caveats to that. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of nuance. I mean, we can take, for example, the situation that happened with Maersk, you know, uh, Maersk was targeted by uh, sensibly what was a nation state um, that you know implemented some some malware in a uh, Ukrainian tax software that then uh, you know everybody that was using that software to like fill out uh, tax and customs forms uh, got a malicious update that infected everybody very very similar to how the um, the solar winds breach happened and in one scenario that caused like obviously um, caused caused Marisk a significant loss due to the uh, the ransomware that was uh, deployed because of that um, but by and large, that's kind of the exception to the rule. Um, I think it's very important to take note of these uh, these activities and like how these attackers actually were able to get access, and then the kind of other things that, that were affected. You know, we, we found out that you know, oh, um, you know, partner Microsoft Office partner programs were actually part of that breach as well, um, and also there was uh, some other. Um, uh, you know, different software used for project management that was also like part of that kind of breach, that whole process where those adversaries were able to get into solar winds. So it's important to like really unpack those things and understand how they did it to make sure that um, your organization is protected against those specific things. But pretty broadly, I wouldn't even be too worried, you know, if you're if you're are a solar winds customer and, you, and you're not using one of those products. Uh, certainly, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be, you know, overly concerned um, because espionage activities are almost always um, very focused with a specific intent in mind. It's not like they go out to compromise all of SolarWinds customers. They probably found out that um, a particular target they were interested in was using SolarWinds products, and this was a potential avenue into that, you know, very protected environment, um, like U.S. Treasury, for example. Um, so those are those are things to like really kind of like take note of and analyze from a defensive posture and say you know if this happened to my organization what would happen, um, but I think that you know overall it's 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 not something that we would say would be a particular concern for for any of our policyholders right off the bat. And I'm going to drop a couple links in the chat and we'll follow up with these as well. We did a couple of recent blog posts about both the SolarWinds and the Mimecast and Microsoft uh, breaches, just to give a little bit more specifics about what happened, what the impact is for our policyholders and for, for businesses in general. Um, and one other thing I just want to note as well is that you know all coalition policyholders are notified whenever we identify a vulnerability associated with your organization. And so anyone who was identified to be a Microsoft and a Mimecast user, as an example, would have received a notification from us saying, we identified this risk, here's the recommendations that we have in order to make yourself more secure. Um, so thankfully didn't impact too many people and you would have heard from us if it did impact you. 
I want to wrap up with one final question and thanks everybody for providing you know, such thoughtful questions throughout this. I had a few questions about how small companies should think about approaching some of the recommendations in the guide and finding good IT support, whether that be encryption specifically or any of the other topics in the guide. Uh, and Jeremy, I'd be curious your thoughts on how people should go about finding IT and security resources if they're a small business and don't have access to those resources in-house. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's really difficult to um, to have a you know one recommendation because um, you know the the IT providers um, that are the right size or the right fit for organizations are going to be so different. But one of the one of the the, the rules of thumb to look for uh, when you're looking for a, a managed service provider is to look look for managed service providers that have a structured program. So like when you when you are you know trying to assess the capabilities of one of these managed service providers. You know, ask them, hey, what, what is your small business program or what, what are the typical recommendations or frameworks that you're using to try to get your all your customers to a certain level of kind of um, operational resiliency or kind of redundancy? And just kind of ask some probing questions to understand that they've put some thought process into the services that they're offering uh, to make sure that, you know, when you're engaging their services, they've kind of thought through those second order effects. You know, if this happens, then what is the plan? Um, you know, instead of just general product recommendations, make sure that there's actually some kind of uh, tangible process that are there's business processes that are behind uh, their recommendations that are going to lead to like a more resilient uh, business operation for your organization. Um, so rather than looking specifically for like one service, like one off, you know, like uh, somebody to set up computers or be a help desk, um, it's really good to try to engage a managed service provider that is is looking to implement like a, a program or a framework. So that way, even if things do happen and things go wrong, which inevitably, like that's just going to be part of the nature. But if there's a framework or a program, there's something to reference or something to tune, something to fix, so that you know there can be uh, changes made incrementally that can kind of improve your posture going forward. And one more point, just to add to that, we have a lot of folks in house uh, who are security experts, including Jeremy and, and several others on our security incident response team. And all of our insureds get access to support from that team before any sort of incident or claim or event happens. And, and I just want to reiterate that we are partners and we are available to all of our policyholders and our brokers for that matter as well to answer sort of specific and individual security questions if you have them. And you know, as much as we are here and on call to help if companies experience some sort of cyber event, we also would love to help you before something happens. And so we would definitely encourage anyone who has specific questions or is looking to get connected to a IT provider in their area to reach out to us. And, and we're happy to help you in-house or point you towards a recommended source near you. Well, with that, I um, wanna just address a few more things before we close. So lots of questions came in throughout about how to access the guide. Um, we will be sending the link to the PDF after this presentation, along with the recording from this webinar. So thank you everyone for your interest. And if you want to access it before then, you can go to this link, coalitioninc.com backslash cybersecurity dash guide uh, and download it there. But again, we will be sending it out with the email as a follow up. And Thank you again for joining us. I know that you know these topics are complex and the security protections and protocols for companies can be challenging to navigate, but we appreciate uh, all of your sort of willingness to learn more about this topic and to think proactively about how to protect your organization. And to reiterate again, that if you ever suspect that you have a claim, suspect that you have some sort of security incident, or just wanna ask questions about how you can uh, protect your organization proactively, we encourage you to reach out to us anytime, either by email or if you have an emergency through our claims hotline. So thank you again for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of your day.